In the history of Western and particularly European music, there are few figures as important and influential as Johann Sebastian Bach, whose compositions would go on to influence some of the great later composers like Mozart and Beethoven and Chopin, and whose works are still listened to and enjoyed today on records and on streaming services hundreds of years later. Many of us, perhaps most of us, have heard some of Bach's works throughout our life, uh, perhaps the composition that often goes under the title Air, or the very dramatic Toccata and Fugue in D minor, uh, or perhaps his cello suites, for example. For those who are more into classical and Baroque music, Bach is of course responsible for some of the greatest masterpieces in history, from his religious pieces like the Mass in B minor or the uh, St. Matthew's Passion, to the Brandenburg Concertos, the Well-Tempered Clavier, and the Goldberg Variations. Bach's music is truly awe-inspiring in its complexity, uh, ambition, and beauty. Now, Bach is obviously one of the most famous and widely studied people in history, so there is very little that I can add to the general discussion on this man. Uh, most of you will be familiar with the basics of his life and his music, so that's not what we're going to be focusing on here. Instead, there is a particular aspect of Bach's music that isn't talked about as much, but which fits into my wider area of study and a lot of my other content. And that is Bach's views on the metaphysics of music. In other words, how does Bach see music as fitting into a larger religious, philosophical, or maybe spiritual framework? Finding religion or religious themes in Bach isn't very hard. Many of his works, such as the St. Matthew's Passion, are based directly on religious themes and on scripture. For the latter half of his life, Bach worked and composed specifically for the church in Leipzig, and by all accounts he seems to have been a rather devoted Protestant Christian. And while these connections are interesting and will be talked about, there are also other aspects of his music where he expands on its relationship with the divine. He seems to have the idea that music can almost be divine, or at least summon the divine presence through its harmony and beauty, and might connect such themes with philosophical ideas of people like Spinoza or Leibniz. But before we get into that topic, let's spend just a few short minutes to get to know the basics of the, the life and and legacy of this man for those of you who aren't that familiar with the topic. Johann Sebastian Bach was a German composer and musician born in 1685 in the city Eisenach. He came from a family of musicians and very early on became involved with music himself. In particular, Bach eventually became a very accomplished keyboardist, playing instruments like the organ. Indeed, it was for his virtuosity in playing the keys that he was arguably most famous during his own lifetime. But history above all remembers him as a composer, and he had already started to compose early in his life. In his youth he worked as a Kapellmeister, or music director basically, of different courts and for different dukes. Most significantly perhaps for Prince Leopold of anhalt kirten between 1717 to 1722 or 23, where he, among other things, composed the so-called Brandenburg Concertos, one of his most famous pieces of music. After some drama, however, he resigned and instead eventually took up a position as director of music in the city of Leipzig, where he continued to write some of his most famous pieces until his death in 1750. Like we said, a lot of Bach's music is overtly religious in nature. It had a spiritual purpose in the sense of being used for church services and for expressing the message of the Gospels. And it seems that Bach didn't necessarily limit this exclusively to his quote-unquote religious compositions. Instead, music itself always serves a religious or spiritual purpose, namely of praising God. He writes in 1738 that, quote, And so the ultimate end or final purpose of all music is nothing other than the praise of God and the recreation of the soul. When this is not taken into account, then there is no true music only a devilish bawling and droning. To Bach, there seems to be something inherently divine in music, especially when it's done for the purpose of praising God, and it can clearly elevate the soul and spirit in a spiritual sense through its correct use in church services, for instance. But does he go even further than this? To say that music has a divine purpose in its ritual use was nothing uncommon at this time. But does Bach think that music in itself, in its very nature, regardless of the context, is divine in some way? According to many sources, it certainly seems that way. 
But to fully grasp this topic, we need to go back in history a bit. The idea that music is divine or somehow participates or reflects divine harmony goes back far into antiquity. The philosophical school or movement of Pythagoreanism, traced back to the famous figure of Pythagoras, was heavily concerned with music and music theory. To the Pythagoreans, reality was essentially mathematical. Everything is made up of numbers and geometry, a universe of harmonious ratios and patterns. So to these philosophers, the universe is harmonious, perfectly so in fact. Everything follows the perfect rules of mathematics and its harmony, a philosophical standpoint often referred to as the quote-unquote music of the spheres. And ideas of harmony are of course directly related to music, which arguably is concerned with harmony in different ways. Thus, to these thinkers, the universe was musical, because mathematics and music are intimately connected, being ruled by the same ratios and structures. Since music and its harmony corresponds directly to mathematical harmony and ratios, at least for the most part, this means that music somehow expresses the divine harmony at the core of reality. In music, we get a glimpse of the higher realities, of the divine world and the truths of reality. With later thinkers like Plato, this idea was further elaborated on, where his world of forms can further elaborate on these themes. Music participates and expresses the essential core features and forms of reality such as beauty and harmony. Indeed, in his arguably most influential dialogue, the Timaeus, Plato describes the creation of the world according to mathematical and musical harmony. The Demiurge, meaning craftsman in Greek, creates the world perfectly according to the precise proportions of music. The spherical universe with its revolving planets all form a cosmic harmony that follows the intervals of a musical scale. In particular, it follows what is known as the Dorian mode, which Plato was particularly fond of. So the whole universe, as fashioned by the Demiurge, is an elaborate musical composition. These kinds of ideas, that music is inherently divine in its nature and can express the deepest aspects of reality or of God, and the correspondence between this microcosmic music we listen to and the macrocosmic music of the universe as a whole, became a prominent and important idea for thinkers much later in history as well. It made its way into Christianity too, with thinkers like Boethius and others, and as we know, music of course came to play a significant role in Christian worship in different ways. By the time of Bach, significant developments had taken place in Christianity and the intellectual world in Europe in general. The Protestant Reformation had transformed Christianity, and Bach was part of the Orthodox Lutheran tradition. Simultaneously, this was also the time of the Enlightenment, and figures like Descartes, Leibniz and Spinoza were transforming the way that people spoke and thought about the world and, and God. All of this would have played a role in Bach's actual music, as well as the way that he conceived of the art in a general sense. The role and value of music in the Lutheran Church was discussed by various theologians and thinkers at the time. Music was generally accepted as a useful and effective part of devotion. Martin Luther had spoken very highly of music, for instance, and any respected Lutheran church in Northern Europe would have had some form of music as part of, it, of its, of its uh, ritual, so to say. At the same time, people disagreed on what kind of music was appropriate for religious use, and whether or not music was valuable in itself, as the Pythagorean tradition would have it, or if it was only valuable insofar as it sort of served a purpose. The former group would argue, similar to what we have seen before, that music and its harmony reflects the harmony of God's creation as a whole, and that it was even a kind of foretaste of heaven, while the other group held that music could equally corrupt as much as it benefited individuals, and that it all depended on the nature of the music, particularly the words that were used, or the lyrics to use relatively modern terminology. The scholar John Butt says, quote, While many theologians give enthusiastic justifications for the use of music, the stress they lay on the importance of the verbal text is crucial. Both composer and performer should pay assiduous attention to what is being sung if the music is to have its correct effective result. For Frick, good music with a bad text can be saved by applying a good text, something which suggests that music has inherent worth, but that its magic is dependent on text and the pious intentions of composer and performer. 
Instrumental music is sometimes encouraged in the light of many Old Testament references, but generally as an activity secondary to vocal music, and always as a support for singers and the all-important text. So where does Bach fall in terms of his personal philosophy of music? Well, this is hard to say since we don't have any sort of clear statements about this topic from Bach himself. He wasn't a philosopher or a theologian himself, after all. But we can sort of glean from certain quotes or comments made by him elsewhere or by his students that he seems to have a kind of idea that music in itself is inherently divine in some way, right? Not just in terms of its use, like being used in a religious context, but that music in itself, in its very nature, can somehow invoke the divine in some way. This becomes perhaps especially clear in a personal copy of a Bible commentary where he writes, quote, When there is a devotional music, God with his grace is always present. In other words, he seems to indicate that when we play music, God becomes directly present and imminent. In Platonic terms, if God is harmony itself, then God is directly present in the harmony and beauty of music. Bach also seems to have believed that the more quote-unquote perfect music is, the more it manifests God, so to say. In some way, music is almost like a divine revelation in itself, an idea that would have been pretty controversial to express overtly at that time. In the students of Bach, such as Birnbaum and Kürnberger, we also find further elaborations on his ideas about the nature of music. To Bach, music is a kind of eternal art form. Music is an eternal part of nature itself, which can be honed by the composer and expressed through the sounds and notes. The goal for a composer, and thus for Bach himself, is to achieve, as best one can, a kind of completeness or perfection which is inherent in all music. The more it reflects this eternal, complete music of nature, the more quote-unquote perfect the music itself is. Quote, Indeed, the German word for Kommenheiten, perfection or completeness, virtually becomes a motto in Birnbaum's essay, a term which effectively unites the concept of honest craftsmanship with a rather more metaphysical sense of perfection, as if the music acted as an imminent realization of cosmic necessity. Birnbaum himself also says, quote, the true amenity of music consists in the connection and alteration of consonances and dissonances without her to the harmony. And, quote, the essential aims of true art are to imitate nature, and, where necessary, to aid it. If art aids nature, then its aim is only to preserve it and to improve its condition, certainly not to destroy it. With this in mind, it becomes hard to argue against the idea that Bach viewed music as somehow divine in itself, that the harmony in music could somehow reflect the harmony of reality itself or the higher realms of reality. An idea that he, of course, had in common with many other philosophers throughout history, such as those of the Platonic and Pythagorean schools. But according to the aforementioned scholar John Butt, there may also be significant connections here with uh, more contemporary philosophers of Bach's own age, such as Spinoza and Leibniz. Particularly in the case of Spinoza, Butt argues for corollaries, albeit probably unconscious on Bach's part, with the metaphysical thought of Spinoza. For instance, the substance monism of Spinoza, where God is the one substance identical to nature and identical to all things, might be mirrored in the conception of Bach towards music as a kind of monistic whole in which the different genres or instruments are simply the modes of this one substance. Bach is indeed very open in his compositions to all kinds of different genres, and certainly sees a value in music in itself as related to the potential and manifestation of perfection. To Spinoza, that perfection is of course God, or the one substance. And the more perfect music is, the more it embodies that perfection of God imminent in all things. There are other aspects of Bach's ideas that could be related to philosophical currents at that time, but Bach was not an academic and it's quite unlikely that he would have been deeply read in these kinds of topics. Keeping all of this in mind, we can consider that when we listen to his Mass in B minor or the St. Matthew Passion, that there are a lot of different philosophical and spiritual processes at work at the same time. For one thing, the music serves a functional purpose of expressing the Orthodox Lutheran faith and the stories from the Gospels, as well as being played in such a specific context in church. 
At the same time, it seems quite possible, from what we have explored here, that Bach also had more metaphysical conceptions of the role and place of music as something in which God becomes imminent or present through the different levels of harmony and perfection that composition and performance can induce. There are, in other words, many layers to the beautiful and profound music that he wrote, which have become some of the most important and significant pieces of music in the European music tradition. Speaking of divine music, I'm actually releasing a new song called Isthmus with my project Zini on December 1st. So mark your calendars for that, and if you're watching this after December 1st, then, you know, check out the song. There'll be links to that stuff in the description. I'm really excited for you all to hear the song, so please let me know what you think when it comes out, and, you know, all the regular stuff, you know, share the song if you like it, and, and like it, and just, just spread the word. So uh, Isthmus, Zini, December 1st, look forward to that. When my research for a video is particularly indebted to or based on a single author or book, I like to give them a special shout out, and in this case, most of what I've said here is based on the scholarship and writings of John Butt, particularly from the book The Cambridge Companion to Bach. There are two chapters in that book that he wrote about the metaphysics of Bach and also uh, discussing the relationship between Bach's ideas of music and philosophers like Spinoza and Leibniz, uh, which is really fascinating stuff. And so if you're interested in this topic, then you should definitely check out uh, those writings to dive a little deeper into what Butt actually argues here. Look forward to more videos like this on the channel where we explore different composers and famous important musicians and figures within music throughout history, as well as more music from me, my own music, so to say. Um, I would love to know what you think about this topic too. Do you think that this is a plausible theory that Bach thought this way about music? Or are we sort of grasping for straws here? And maybe it's maybe it just, it just isn't that deep. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think and we can continue this discussion there. Regardless, I hope you found this video interesting and educational and I'll see you in the next video.